Back to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 11, Web Services, SOAP, and WSDL. A couple of announcements. So uh, the fourth project is due next Wednesday, and it's tonight that we'll introduce the remainder of the material that it assumes, web services particularly. Uh, you should have received by now feedback on your final project proposals per my emails last night. If you have any questions, feel free to chat with me during break or after class or by email. Uh, other announcement is that We'll have section right after class, as usual, focusing on the web services aspect of Project 4. Uh, but since this is the last assigned project, this will be the last of our official sections. So in future weeks, if you want to chat one-on-one -on -one or in small groups about your own project, we can certainly do that uh, as well. So again, any last opportunity for initial questions here? No? OK, so let's take a quick look back at last time, which again was our conclusion to XML schema. We focused particularly on simple types again and on complex types and really yet on providing you with the remainder of the syntax and really features of XML schema, giving you really a taste of what's in those three recommendations. So we looked again at simple types, um, but maybe we should start with that simplest of question first, which is what was XML schema all about? In a sentence. The rules for for the content. Thought, thought, thought. The content of what? Okay, so the rules for the content of XML files. It allows you to specify what must be in the file, what should be in the file. If it is in the file, that is, an if, in if, if an element or an attribute is in the file, exactly what value it must have. So it really allows you to exercise some degree of control over what your XML inputs should look like, or rather must look like. So what does it mean to validate an XML document? Perfect. So it's just to make sure that an XML document is in conformance with the schema. So a lot of websites uh, have one of those links from the W3C having their little icon that says this website is XHTML compliant or even this website is um, HTML 4.01 compliant. So what does that mean specifically in terms of HTML or XHTML if a website is conformant to XHTML or HTML? Yeah, that's all it means. So for the languages known as HTML and XHTML, there are schemas or DTDs from the W3C? Yeah, so DTDs just tends to be the manner in which those languages themselves are sort of written in stone. And that just means that that website presumably has been validated against the W3C's DTD for whatever language is being used, XHTML or HTML. What does that mean in real terms? It probably just means the webmaster copied the URL of their website, pasted it into the W3C's validator and said validate, and all that does is essentially runs an XML parser or the equivalent on their websites, HTML or XHTML, checks that it's valid with respect to a DTD from the W3C, and if yes, you get a big uh, green light and an icon you can then display on your website. But functionally, it's meaningless, right? You could slap those labels on your own website even if you don't even know what XHTML is. They're just images and such. So last time, we looked at this alternative, again, to DTD, XML schema. It's much more expressive. It has more features. It allows us to impose stronger data typing on the inputs that we're passing to our application. We had simple types, vis-a-vis -vis complex types. Simple types uh, came in forms like these. We might have defined a year, a uh, name, last modification date to be of any of these built-in data types, and we'll see those recurring actually tonight and perhaps in the future. We might have seen attributes like country similarly being specified as a string. What at the core was a simple type, though? What does it mean to be of simple type? Sorry? It's predefined, not necessarily, because you can have simple types that are not necessarily these built-in or primitives, right, because we could extend or restrict them. Perfect. So it doesn't have any children and it doesn't have any attributes. So if an element is of simple type, means it can't have children and it can't have attributes. In turn, an attribute is by nature then of what type? Simple, because obviously it can't have either of those as well. So we also looked at complex types. And this is where we spent most of our time last week. We saw things like this. The definition for a type called, say, size. And in English, just as a refresher here, what does it mean if your type is size? with regard to your values. Mm 
All right, it just means your value had better be small, medium, or large, quote, unquote. So it's one of these uh, enumerated values. Genes, by contrast, is an extension of this complex type, or this simple type known as size. So it's based on simple content. Um, but what do we mean if a, an element is of type genes now? So same, same idea it means that the element is similarly of type size, but with the added bonus that it has this attribute known as sex, which can only apparently take on one of these two values, male or female. So it was this ability to extend data types that we dwelled on last week. Does the enumeration give you any kind of order? Does the enumeration give you any kind of order? Um, no, it enumerates um, the possibilities in the sense of just offering you a menu of options. But that's all. At the end of the day, it can only take on one of these values, wherever it is in the list. Correct. There's no notion of ordering there. So simple content here refers to the four types of content models that we could have. We could have simple content, which, um, well, let's see. We had simple content, which simply meant that the complex type was essentially based on a simple type. It was an extension or a restriction thereof. And we saw alternatives to this, which was in the form of having um, a complex type that extends, say, another complex type, which was slightly more interesting. So here was one of our content models as well for complex types. We might have an XML fragment here, clearly describing some guy, John Harvard, semantically. And we might have an element defined, na called na an element called name, described in terms of schema like this, which pretty much specifies that if someone is going to have a name element in their file, it's got to look structurally exactly like this. Does the order matter of first and last name here? Yes, so that was one of the um, inherent definitions or uh, the inherent characteristics of XSD sequence. This was in contrast with two other alternatives. We saw in lieu of sequence, what other options for the same idea? Yes, so choice and all. So and they're sort of self-explanatory, but again, all just means that you must have each of the elements that are enumerated present, but in any order. And choice affected what we described as sort of a loop, where on each iteration through this sort of conceptual loop, you can pluck out any of the possible options and ergo in any particular order. Um, the default value for these attributes known as minikers and maxikers, which don't appear to be present here, or by default, what always? One. So if you see an element called first there, that pretty much means it has to be there unless you're inside of XSD choice because it's assumed to be of minikers, maxikers equals one. And we similarly saw that same attribute used on, say, XSD sequence itself which allowed you to have that sequence again and again and again and again if max occurs was greater than one. Mixed content. In English, what does it mean to have mixed content? So it means to have PC data where? In an XML file, yes, but that can't end all of our sentences. So PC data where exactly? Yeah, so just interspersed with actual element content. And actually, Jen, would you mind popping open a couple of the windows? Feel free to close them if it gets chilly. So here was an example of mixed content. Again, I, qu I qualified this as being somewhat of a contrived example. More reasonable might be examples involving, say, XHTML, where you have a paragraph element inside of which are bold tags and italics tags, and obviously an intermingled is the actual PC data, the actual character content you're trying to display. But this works, too, for the sake of exposition. We have an element here called letter, which is consistent with the fragment there. And the only thing we had to do to specify that something was not just of element only content, but rather was mixed, is just that simple attribute. Mixed equals true. Everything else should be familiar syntax. So clearly then, implicitly, the default value of mixed has been thus far false and not true. Questions? Comments? It's kind of nice. We're actually getting chirping birds now. Empty content. This sort of speaks for itself, but a quick example nonetheless. Foo bar equals baz. So an element that's of complex type whose content model is empty, that is, it has empty content, still might be useful in the world of XHTML. The BR tag is useful, even though it has neither children nor attributes. In this case, we might have an element called foo that is somehow affected by this attribute bar. To prescribe this, 
which suffices to simply specify just the attribute. Right? If you don't specify any sequence, any choice, any XSD all, well, implicitly there are no child elements, so it suffices to just mention that there's an attribute present there. So we saw that kind of example as well. Any questions then on XML schema? So project four, if you haven't tackled this part already, realize has you as sort of an intellectual exercise, play around with schema to some degree. But at the end of the day, the project has you just turn off validation altogether since much of the content that you would otherwise be validating is being generated by you in the first place. And unless you don't trust your own coding skills to make correct XML, there's really no sense in incurring any sort of performance impact by constantly validating your own dynamically generated output. But we nonetheless show you how you might do that, which which is useful if your input's not coming from your own code, but say from someone else's. Okay, so tonight is all about web services, which are kind of cool. And besides using a web service yourself in the form of Project 4's warehouse, you'll also, in this last week of the project, uh, make use of Amazon's web service, which is sort of representative of what a lot of big sites are beginning to do these days in terms of opening up their platform, opening up their data sets to the public at large in sort of a standard way. Right? For 20, 30 years, there have long existed companies and such that allow you to download or pay for APIs that allow you to somehow interface with their own code, with their own database, with their own data sets. Web services fundamentally doesn't change that model, but it's an attempt sort of to standardize that same idea. And so at the end of the day, nothing that we do today is technology or feature sets that haven't been possible for as long as there have existed network connections and human written software, but it's sort of a different angle on this same problem of allowing people either to interface with each other's code in a fairly elegant way, or, and more powerfully tonight, allowing you to execute the equivalent of remote procedure calls in a platform and language independent way. And that, if nothing else, I think is sort of the value add, so to speak, of web services versus some of the previously um, popular solutions. So we'll see a number of examples, and we'll tease apart what's underneath the hood of web services today. And that will give you your foundation for Project 4 and hopefully beyond. So quick word on, well, actually, let's do this. Let me turn our attention back to Project 4, since thus far we've been waving our hands at this warehouse aspect. I'm going to go into my Project 4 distribution. I'm going to open my conf directory server.xml file, and I'm just going to make sure that I have my port number specified. For our demo, I don't even need one up there, so I just gave myself 8080, which thus far none of you seem to be using, which is good, because I never try to access the wrong person's project. I'm going to go ahead and run ants just to make sure our code is built. Okay, everything was built, but notice when you first download the code, recall how many files actually got compiled, and we'll actually see where these 171 files came from tonight. Those were specifically from Amazon, but they're not files I downloaded from Amazon for you. They're files I generated using one file from Amazon. So we'll see what that means. These kinds of errors, now that we're using Java 5 about unchecked operations and so forth, you can kind of turn a blind eye to those. Those are simply the result of these 171 source files having been automatically generated. And the tool that generated them simply hasn't been as cautious as it might have been with regard to that. Um, so we've got our code compiled. I'm going to go ahead and run Tomcat. Notice that I'm on ICE 4. So I'm going to go ahead in my browser and go to ice4.fas.harvard.edu, colon 8080. And I'm going to let us go into the root for the moment. Oh. Ah, there we go. Thank you. OK, so we're in the root uh, web app of this particular distribution. And recall that at least these two files you've been using just for diagnostic purposes. Tonight, though, we'll spend a bit more time on this thing called Access. This file here is a file that comes with this toolkit called Access. And long story short, Access is a project from uh, the Apache Foundation that allows you to generate code with which you might access web services. That is it in a nutshell, but we'll tease apart its features tonight. This is just a file I pulled from the distribution because it essentially reports to your web browser exactly whether or not your machine is configured as it should be. And realize, those of you who got somewhat overwhelmed by the size of the appendix for Project 4, a number of these files are not necessary for getting access up and running. The jars, the many jars that you downloaded weren't necessarily required, but it at least gets rid of any and all potentially worrisome errors 
error messages or warnings, which is why I just put them in there so you would know at least how to get everything up and running 100%. So that's just background in case you play with this in the future on your own. So our application that we've been playing with or you've been developing is, of course, Scamazon. This, again, is my university journal distribution, so it doesn't do much of anything. If I instead go to the warehouse application, this is all, I don't know if you pulled this up, but this is your warehouse. And this is just meant to be cute because you're never actually going to interface with the warehouse with a web-based interface. Rather, all communications, recall from our diagram of Project 4, are going to sort of be behind the scenes via a PO element and a PO ACK element. So the user himself never actually interfaces with the warehouse. So this is really just a placeholder, but there is some neat stuff going on behind the scenes. In fact, I'm going to go ahead now and pull up our PDF for the project, which is here. Oh, and incidentally, while we're here, as I mentioned in an email, I've gone ahead and posted, for those of you who allowed such, all of the proposals that were submitted. Realize, as I say here, just because they're there doesn't mean that's necessarily what each of these students is going to be doing, or doesn't mean necessarily the proposal was sufficient. So I simply posted the original proposals there, just to give you a sense of what to expect um, among your classmates, especially if you're curious to chat with them about their particular ideas. Project 4 spec is right here. And those of you who have read through it fully, including the content about web services, which I did caution that you could turn a blind eye to for a while, notice that it's in question 10 or so that the spec begins talking about web services. And it walks you through the steps of dynamically generating code with a utility called Wisdle to Java. Um, this is a tool that comes with Axis that we'll look at tonight, but long story short, what Axis, in the form of this particular tool, Wisdel to Java, is doing is it's allowing you to dynamically generate Java code with which you, a developer, can interface with Project 4's warehouse. You yourselves never do this for reasons that really just boil down to the fast that, fact that FAS has this whole cluster of machines, ICE 1, ICE 2, ICE 3, and it's just a pain dealing with the different host names. So I gave you that proxy class that sort of eliminates that potential problem. But with Amazon, will you actually be following steps just like these? But this is the neat thing. I'm going to go ahead into our code distribution here, into source, CSCIE 259, project 4, warehouse. Inside of warehouse, there's just one file, purchasing.java. Purchasing.java if you haven't looked at it already, has this method called process PO, which essentially is terribly similar to a lot of the sample code you've been given before, whereby it takes an XML input in the form of a string. It opens a style sheet, namely poac.xsl, and applies that style sheet to the string of XML and returns the results. That's really all it does. It's a terribly short class. Notice that it is in a class called purchasing that doesn't extend anything. It doesn't implement an interface. It literally is as simple as a class that you might write in, say, your first Java programming class, which is simply to say it's a fairly simple class and therefore program, and it's pretty short, even though it has these lines of code for validation and such, you've seen all these before. And the only additional content it has is this error listener, which simply allows you to field any validation errors by having the appropriate warning or error handler called. But that's it. As far as code goes, you've pretty much seen it all before. But here's the neat thing. Once this uh, web service is up and running, the spec asks that you go to, for instance, this URL, http dot 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 warehouse slash services slash purchasing question mark Wisdle. And because of the way the web.xml file is configured that I provided you with for this project, what we're about to see is automatically generated by this same tool called Axis. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this. I'm going to go back to our browser. And notice that it's just going to append services slash purchasing. I'm going to go ahead and change the host name accordingly to ICE4. And I'm going to go ahead and hit Enter. And going to add the port back, and there we go. This is not a file that you were given. This is not an XML file. This is not a so-called WSDL file that exists in the code you downloaded. This was, shall we say, automagically generated from purchasing.java. And herein lies sort of a hint of the power of web services. You can, simply by implementing some code in the form of a standard Java class with a method called, in this case, PO, uh, process PO, you can then have this tool 
access automatically generate this thing. Now, we'll tease apart some of the nuances of this file tonight to give you a sense of what's going on underneath the hood. But this is an example of WSDL, Web Services Description Language. And it's essentially a platform and language independent way of describing the functionality that, in this case, some Java class provides. So notice, we won't tease it apart just yet, but what, for instance, keywords jump out at you as familiar already? So uh, prototype. Port, okay, so port is in there, and more specifically, I'll coax this along, so process PO is explicitly mentioned in there, and that again was the name of the method in that Java file. There's probably a mention, yep, of the package name there, so clearly there's some derivation of this file from that actual source code, and then notice there seem to be things like this that weren't present explicitly in that Java file, but kind of suggest their role. Process PO response, process PO return. Essentially, what this file is going to do for us is it's going to describe essentially how a third party developer can access that class, process PO, or purchasing rather, by way of RPC, remote procedure calls. There's enough information embedded in this file to teach a third party developer, or rather a developer with a toolkit like Access, to know how to execute process PO from any computer, in theory, on the internet. How does it know where that, call, uh, that service is? How does it know where to send the remote procedure call? Well, notice embedded in this file is the host name and the port of where that service is. And this, long story short, is why I abstracted some of these details away for your own use of Project 4, because you end up embedding a specific host name in there, typically by default. But you'll do it anyway with the Amazon Web Service. Sure. Can you see the web.xml file? If I exactly. So Axis, as we'll see further tonight, is what's called a, a SOAP engine, among other things. Axis comes with a number of components. One of them is a SOAP engine, which effectively runs as a servlet within your instance of Tomcat. So the, the, the hoops that you jump through, if you set up your own instance of Tomcat on your own machine using the appendix for Project 4, was, among other things, about setting up Axis inside of your Tomcat installation so that it would know how to process requests of the form like this in the URL. So access effectively is rather, if you recall our multi-step process for how a servlet works and how an application server works, I think we had five or eight steps enumerated a couple lectures ago. Essentially, once you configure your servlet container, Tomcat, with support for access, it realizes that this particular URL is a request for a web service, so it delegates control of that request to access. Access does its thing, returns a response object, and then the servlet container Tomcat returns that to you. This WSDL is generated by the tool called Access based on the URL up there, and that URL is sufficient input to tell Access to look at purchasing.java to generate this automatically. And again, this is meant to be more of a sneak preview. We'll tease this apart and walk through this in a moment. Let me actually field this question and go to the web.xml file, which in this case is in our web apps directory in warehouse, in web inf, and in web.xml. So one of the configuration files you were given for this project, which is slightly customized for your warehouse subdirectory as opposed to your Scamazon subdirectory, which doesn't know about web services per se, is this. So a lot of this is standard. Um, this essentially was copied by me from the access distribution, and then I part it down to only have as many lines as we really needed. But among the things it does for us is this. It defines a servlet called access servlet, gives it a you know, human-friendly display name, and then it specifies what class implements this servlet. Now, why does this work? Well, among the jars you copied into your Tomcat installation, if you did this on your own PC or Linux box or Mac, was a jar for Axis, which has that particular code. If we scroll down, there's another servlet down here, an admin servlet, which we don't really use, but I left its code in there. There's the SOAP monitor service and some other things. But the most interesting point and most perhaps uh, familiar uh, element to mention now is the servlet mapping. The servlet mapping is defined in these three instances, and it's this last one that's the most relevant. What, in effect, does this last or this particular servlet mapping do functionally? And I know we haven't taught you 
configuration files, so you would just infer this from the old ones. Yeah, exactly. So and you've seen this before, and if you like this kind of you know, system administration type stuff, go back and look at Project 3 now and its configuration files, and you'll see how I set things up. This essentially just means any request for a URL that begins with slash services slash something should be handed by Tomcat to this servlet for processing. And then it does its crun number crunching and so forth, returns a response, and then Tomcat gives your browser that particular HTTP response object. So that's all. And we've seen this before. Recall from project three, I think I did show you the web.xml file that mapped uh, slash view to the view.java class. And it mapped uh, slash prefs to the prefs.java class and so forth. Same idea is going on here. It's just access is a little more complicated, say, than the view and the prefs files that we initially gave you. They actually have implementations of this tool built in. Did you have to ever tell access about purchasing? Did I ever have to? So did I ever have to tell Axis about purchasing, or did it just assume uh, the information that it presented me with based on the file? The latter. And that's what's cool. That's what's auto magic about it. All you, the developer on the server side, need to do is just go and implement your code, as you're sort of used to doing. And deploying it as a web service literally is as simple as just making sure Axis knows where it is or knows how the user might access it. And if you look incidentally at our build.xml file, you'll see that uh, you'll see the following. Let's see, in warehouse.xml, uh, warehouse web apps, let me just check. Okay, warehouse, webinf, inside of classes now is where the build file puts the purchasing class. So again, if we look through all of the configuration files, including the other web.xml file, the server.xml file, at the end of the day, what it would specify is that the warehouse service is simply in this classes directory. But you've seen, you have seen this before, or you've been given this same structure before. The only new addition, really, with Project 4 versus Project 3 was the addition of this customized web.xml file and, of course, the jars and such that you added to your project, uh, to your installation of Tomcat. Okay, so longer teaser than intended, but that's okay, because it is kind of, it is more uh, configuration than we've offered before. So let's come back to the basics of web service, and then we'll go back toward not only Project 4, but also some quick and dirty demos that sort of highlight how you might use this um, when the first time you discover, say, via Google, a web service that you want to make use of. So the history of um, web services you know, dates back you know, pretty much as far as XML itself. And there have been a number of approaches to the same idea that we're focusing on tonight. XML RPC is sort of an alternative approach to the exact same idea. It's an XML-based way of implementing remote procedure calls. And for those unfamiliar, incidentally, what you as a user, or what is you as a developer usually write are LPCs, local procedure calls, which just means you write a method, you call another method. You write another method, it calls another method. Those are all local. Remote procedure calls simply are those that you might type and compile on your machine. And some code gets executed locally, but ultimately you pass input over the wire to some other server usually, which has its own code running, it returns a return value which comes back over the wire, the internet, cable modem, whatever, local network, and then your own code displays the result. So the procedure is actually implemented elsewhere. For the curious, here's just a bit of a background on who exactly was involved with SOAP, how many years of development it sort of had. Um, it's useful, um, SOAP and XML RPC, um, for the following reason, if nothing else, it automates a lot of the headache that might otherwise be involved in you, the developer, implementing RPCs. You, the developer, if you use web services or XML RPC or SOAP via web services, never have to deal with the headache of implementing TCP IP sockets or UDP sockets that require that you would uh, take your inputs, somehow transmit them over the wire, sit there in like a for loop waiting for the response to come back over the network, handling the issue of what if the connection times out, what if I only get a partial response, all of the headache that boils down to writing network layer systems code, you don't have to deal with. Because among other things, SOAP and XML RPC are designed to simplify all of that. For instance, the process of sending an int over the wire or a string over the wire or a double over the wire isn't necessarily obvious as to how best to do that 
on first glance. You might have to consider things like network byte order, whether it's big endian or little endian, and you'd have to deal with those kinds of issues. So among the things that SOAP and XML RPC in particular do for you is standardize data types as they go across the wire. So you can just implement your class and your methods and say, give me a string as an input, give me an int as an input, return a double, and these languages allow you to express those data types over the wire without you yourself having to manually implement the transfer of this data. Um, the architecture, um, this is sort of, a, I would say, a high-level overview of what we've sort of discussed in more real terms. Um, remote procedure calls, two pieces of jargon that are worth mentioning because you see these throughout tools like Access are the following, stub and skeleton. So essentially, a typical web service works as, or a remote procedure call for that matter, works as follows. You have two players involved. If I am the developer who wants to execute a remote procedure call, that means I'm going to uh, invoke the RPC on my machine, but it's going to get executed elsewhere, and I'm going to get the response. If I then want to use or execute that RPC, I essentially invoke what's called a stub. The stub is simply sort of a layer of abstraction. It's a gateway via which the inputs I provide to the method are serialized or marshaled, as they say, over the network connection to the machine where they're actually going to be used and executed. Meanwhile, on that other machine, there's running a skeleton. The sole purpose in life of the skeleton is sort of to wait there and receive these inputs and then pass it to the particular implementation. So in the case of our project four, purchasing.java is the implementation of the procedure. The stub code is what the project spec has you generate using that WSDL to Java tool. The skeleton, meanwhile, is automatically generated by Axis, and you never actually see it in use. So the stub and skeleton code, fundamentally, are just the network-related code that you inherently need to use if you want to invoke a RPC on one machine and have it executed elsewhere. The stub is the client-side network code. The skeleton is the server-side network code. But it's the implementation, pretty much, that you have to worry about only, purchasing .java in that particular case. So we'll see tonight on using Access how you might generate stubs and or skeletons. Yeah. Uh, is there a servlet handling the SOAP request? Yes, that's the access servlet that serves effectively as the skeleton that's going to receive all of these network-based responses. The stub code, you yourself have to not write, but generate automatically. So those 171 files, effectively, are stub files that connect to Amazon's web service. And if you follow the steps in the spec, you can generate manually a stub for the purchasing service, but that's exactly what I hand wrote for you in that proxy class, or that proxy method. WSDL to Java generates stub code based on a WSDL file. And again, we'll see this all in action. And incidentally, WSDL to Java can generate skeleton code, but the beauty of Axis is that it does it automatically for you. You don't need to do that. So what is SOAP? Just to formalize this, simple object access protocol. So it is a language that's used to serialize an RPC across the network. It is a language, an XML-based language, that allows you to express the names of a method being invoked, the inputs there to, and the outputs there from. So essentially, it's just a way of specifying what the parameters are and what the return values are and what the names of methods are using an XML format that uses, we'll see, say, XML schema's data type so that you have all the built-in data types that you would hope would exist, ints, floats, doubles, strings, and so forth. It's fundamentally little different from technologies you might be familiar with already. DCOM in the world of Windows, Coraba, Java RMI, all of which can be used to implement similar ideas through execution of remote procedure calls. The fundamental difference is, I dare say, that XML RPC and SOAP specifically are entirely platform and language independent. You can use them with Perl, PHP, C Sharp, Java, and that alone is a huge plus for a lot of situations. They're not tied necessarily to a Windows platform or to a Linux platform. They can be used on any platform for which, quite simply, there exists support. Similar in spirit, but not implementation to the whole idea of Java, which it's supposed to be um, platform independent, even though there are some gotchas even with that. But don't confuse, don't take the analogy too far. There's no idea of a there's no notion of a virtual machine or anything like that when it comes to SOAP. So 
What is SOAP exactly? So there's three aspects to a SOAP XML message. So SOAP is the language in which uh, the intercommunication is implemented for these RPCs, and there's three components to it, and we'll tease them apart by way of example. There's an envelope that kind of describes the whole transmission that's going from client to server. There's a set of encoding rules that will essentially embed in the document the data types and so forth, and what it is that's being sent over the wire and what should come back. And then there's a convention for representing the RPCs and responses, so a lot of metadata that essentially just set up exactly what this XML message is meant to do procedurally in between client and server. So let's make this more real. When you invoke Project 4's web service, and to do that, recall, you yourselves only need to execute that, um, I think it's the process PO method in the proxy class. I forget the specific name, but I give you a proxy method that effectively allows you to just call a method locally, but it actually gets executed over the network, even though at the end of the day, it's going out the loopback interface, the same Ethernet interface on the same machine. But what is really going on behind the scenes? Well, what I did was I essentially installed the equivalent of a packet sniffer on an instance of Project 4 running on my machine so I could capture exactly what message was really being sent from Scamazon to the warehouse. And for simplicity, again, to be clear, it's not actually going over the internet because they're both running on the same machine, but the mechanism is the same. It's just not going over great distance. So what is the message that's being sent from Scamazon to the warehouse when it comes time to process a purchase order? It's this, HTTP request. So web services typically, though not necessarily, run over HTTP. You can do crazy things like run it over SMTP or even other protocols, but most common is probably HTTP. So we've teased apart these kinds of headers somewhat before when we talked about HTTP and such. So let's focus on this part. This is our so-called SOAP message. The outer wrapper is the envelope. Notice all this stuff before the colon is just namespace stuff. So it happens to be longer by convention, but there's no magic there. But envelope is the relevant root element that we mentioned earlier. There's all the namespace information that's all standardized. And notice it mentions not only SOAP, but also Schema. So schema is being used to give us data types in this idea of RPCs. Inside of an envelope, you have the body. You might also have a header or a head if necessary, but not in this case. And just infer, even though it's a little verbose, what does this message say to the server that's receiving this message? That is, what does this say to the warehouse who receives this? I'm sending you a string. I'm sending you a string. Call. Uh, call uh, not called PO so much as whose value is open bracket PO slash close bracket. And notice the entity use, because we're sending an XML fragment inside of an XML fragment. It seems like that's the first and apparently only argument provided, arg0. If there were more, we'd probably see arg1, arg2, arg3, and so forth. Um, what method is expected to receive this input, apparently? What method in the warehouse is expected to receive this? Yeah, it looks like this is being sent, you know, effectively as an argument, as an input to process PO. Now, you could implement the same idea in any number of ways in an XML format. This is the approach that SOAP takes to standardizing the names of methods and the forms of inputs. How do outputs get involved? Well. With this same packet sniffer, I then watched what the warehouse sent back to Scamazon as a response. You, the developer, get back this response literally as a string via that proxy method. Right? And that's the nice thing. right? You don't even know that any of this is going on behind the scenes. That is one of the beauties of web services. It all happens sort of transparently to you, the user. We're teasing it apart because it's sort of interesting and fun, perhaps, to understand how it's working. Here's the HTTP response header. Here's another envelope that's coming back this time from warehouse to Scamazon. Apparently, and notice this should sound slightly familiar, if you recall from the WSDL that mentioned this, the response that comes back apparently is called process PO response. That's Axis's way of standardizing the method's response. It looks like that response's return value, as implied here, is also of type string, and its response is what? Yeah, so open bracket, POAC, slash, close bracket. 
So apparently, I sniffed this before I even implemented the project, right? Because by default, when you download the source code, this works. It just sends PO and it just gets back from POAC.xsl the POAC element. So I sniffed it at the time. But once you've implemented that file, POAC.xsl, and once you've actually augmented this PO element from the request to include your data, if you yourself sniffed this connection or monitored what was going on behind the scenes, maybe printed things out to Tomcat's to console, you would actually see not just something trivial like this, but you would actually see all of the data that you're getting back and providing as strings. And SOAP and web services in general is what provides you with all of this functionality without having to even know what HTTP is or even know what SOAP is. You, the developer, get the illusion of a method call, in our case, that proxy method. Okay, any questions? Okay, so just to tease a couple of these things apart, we looked at them by way of example. We'll come back, I think, after break with a couple of demonstrations thereof. So envelope is just that top level element. It sort of just defines everything in one nice wrapper. It can have a header element, which we did not see in this case, but the body is where the interesting parts are. The body having the type of request, the type of response coming back. And coding rules, what do we mean by this? Well, this is one of the pluses of SOAP. You, the developer, don't have to worry about what it means to serialize a float over the wire, byte order and all that nonsense, you don't have to worry about it, this level of development. In fact, you can even serialize or let Access help you serialize entire Java objects. If you have a student object that you want to pass as input to a method, and that student object as uh, inner members has a string called first name, a string called last name, and an int called ID, similarly can web services help you um, essentially can figure out if the object is of sufficient uh, of uh, sufficient simplicity, figure out how to serialize a student object. So you can actually invoke a method that takes a reference to a student object. That student object gets sent over the wire, marshalling or serializing it along the way. It gets demarshaled or deserialized on the other end. And what the server, the skeleton, receives effectively is a student object, not an XML file per se, but that student object again, and the response can then come back in some other form. So you're not necessarily restricted to just these primitives, but what SOAP does use is XML schema for certainly its primitives. And we saw that in the form of XSD string a moment ago. If you do want to serialize more complicated objects like a student class and so forth, you have to provide typically a schema. So therein lies, for instance, one of the upsides of actually knowing how to write schema, even though we haven't used it so much. It is a way of defining precisely, not just for humans reading a spec, but for computers who need to rely on that to figure out what's inside of it, how the toolkit, how the SOAP engine might have to serialize, say, a student object. You can simply specify what's inside of it, expressing that with schema. What's a SOAP router? Well, a SOAP router is effectively like that access servlet that we mentioned in the context of web.xml. The SOAP engine is just the piece of software that handles the, the magic that we've been seeing in terms of the automatic generation of that request and say that response that comes back. So it listens on the appropriate protocol, HTTP in our example, receives SOAP requests, figures out who to pass those requests to once the information's been turned back into primitives or into an object, it ultimately returns the response. And here's just a quick summary of what Access is. Access is just a servlet that can be deployed in a web server or application server to provide precisely that functionality. And it was a perfect uh, introduction before when we looked at web.xml to a SOAP router being uh, 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 added to Tomcat. So what's this thing called WSDL? And we'll tease this apart. So WSDL is just, again, this sort of language and platform independent way of describing what's called a web service. What's a web service? It's a program, it's a method, it's a class, whatever, however you want to view the world, that, is ex a, that can be executed effectively over the web. So it's in spirit like a CGI application or any of these web-based applications people have been writing for years. But the neat thing is that it's not an application you have to expressly develop for the web or develop for the internet. You can just implement the purchasing class that just so happens to have a method called process PO, takes a string as input, returns a string as output, and using a SOAP engine like Access, can you just expose that functionality to the world for anyone to make use of, provided they adhere to the conventions of inputs and outputs.
you don't have to worry about any of the network-based connectivity. And so in that regard, it's fundamentally different from CGI and JSPs and all of that. You don't have to care as the developer about network stuff. So what does WSDL do? It describes these three things. What the service can do, inputs, outputs, and so forth. Where it is, we saw that. We saw the URL and port number hard-coded. How to invoke it. A lot of that semantic metadata is about telling the client how to generate a stub to invoke that particular service. You typically see WSDL being used in conjunction with SOAP, but it isn't necessarily the case that they need to be intertwined. It's an independent uh, recommendation itself. So we saw that WSDL file before. I'll go back to our project three, or project four, which is still running, and the URL we were at was this. This file, I said before, was automatically generated. And you can ignore all these hyphens and stuff. This is IE or Firefox's way of pretty printing XML data. But the, this is just an XML file. But notice at top, you know, we have in the form of an XML comment, hey, this was created by Axis on April 22 at 6.55 PM. OK, so the clock on the server is indeed quite off, it seems, um, which might explain your NFS issues that you mentioned earlier. 11? No, wait. Yeah, no, it's not the 22. It's, today's the 18th. 2006. Yeah, in 2006. Yeah, so that is way. Oh, OK, wait. It's not the file that was generated. Access was last updated at that point, which is also, I think, a partial lie since this version came out more recently than that. So anyhow, we're OK. This was automatically generated. This is not a file that's actually on NICE right now. So what's going on inside of this? And I'll provide this disclaimer. It's useful to be able to skim a WSDL file if you're looking at it yourself to figure out exactly what functionality is provided or what are the methods called that you should subsequently be able to invoke. But for the most part, this is more meant for a computer than it is meant for a human, even though it is in this XML format. So what's inside of this? Well, this is just a, uh, a simpler example of a WSDL file. This was taken from a web service called Currency Exchange that I found on this directory, which will conclude with a mention of tonight, xmethods.net is a pretty good directory for finding web services. And I'll pull a web service from there tonight and will on the fly write, um, write a program that uses one of these freely available web services. And the one I prepared was one that allows you to, you to provide a zip code and it tells you what state that zip code belongs to. And just as a teaser, actually, there are little things like that that one might have in their own personal or work projects, like implementing shipping information. It's probably a pain to track down a big, fairly big database file that maps all zip codes to all cities and states, say, in the United States. If you, your company, want to be able to figure out by phone or via internet orders what someone's city state is based only on their zip code, which if nothing else is a convenience. That's data you would have to update if the post office or feds change the layout of zip codes and so forth. So that idea alone Something as silly or simple as zip code translation is sort of a nice use of something like web services where someone else can sort of officially host um, zip code information. For instance, the post office itself. And anytime you want to do a lookup, you can simply invoke that service simply by writing one line of Java code. And you'll get back a string, for instance, saying Massachusetts for a particular zip code. So that's sort of a teaser of where, even in the simplest of cases, web services might be a useful thing to take advantage of. Here's a WSDL file that describes from the same site a currency exchange service, whereby you provide it with, say, USD, and you get back yen, the equivalent thereof, or British pounds, or some similar currency. So what is inside of a typical WSDL file? This is an excerpted, complete WSDL file. So you have definitions down to closed definitions. You have the notion of messages in a WSDL file. You have the notion of what are called ports in the WSDL file, which are similar but not really the same as, say, HTTP ports, binding information, and service information. So what do these mean in reverse order? Well, this last element simply specifies where the service is. And we saw a URL and port number earlier. How are these operations invoked? Sort of metadata that tells the client exactly how to call these methods remotely. What operations does this service provide? Well, these are really when you see the enumerations of the methods that are provided by way of web services. So looking, zooming in on the message here, which we had dot, dot, dots for a moment ago, apparently this web service provides you with a provides you with a method or function effectively called get rate request. Well, get rate request apparently takes two arguments, country one 
and country two, the goal being you provide USD, you get back Japanese yen or, again, some other currency. And it looks like this same service returns something called, uh, returns a message called get rate response, which is of type float, which presumably gives you the, um, the, uh, the rate between the two. Well, what about that port type element? So zoom in on what were previously dot, dot, dots. This here specifies essentially what operations go, can go in and what operations can come out. In other words, it describes precisely the inputs and the outputs to this particular web service. And again, there's no need to memorize this sort of thing or there's no need to worry about ever writing this kind of code manually. The utility in at least getting exposure or a glimpse of this kind of code is so that you can skim or read it yourself, not write it yourself. This is meant to be automatically generated. If it weren't, the whole utility of web services sort of gets called into question. Here's a zoomed in version of the binding. Um, the binding simply specifies, for instance, what exact operations can get called, get rate in this case. It specifies exactly what the input is to that particular operation, that particular method and so forth, specifies exactly what the output is going to be like. And again, a tool like WSDL to Java, which comes with access, uses this information to dynamically generate, automatically generate that so-called stub code, which we'll use in just a bit. And there's some more formal definition of binding. Finally, service. So a service is, can include not only some documentation, which can be useful certainly in the absence of anything else, but it can also specify also specifies the so-called endpoint. It tells the toolkit the, where the service is actually available. And that's sort of necessary because the WSDL file might be something you download from some other source. It might be something that someone gave you. So inherent or in, contained inside of the WSDL file is all of the information necessary to finding this web service as well. And finally, types. You can have types embedded in the WSDL file itself, and here's where we see this use of XML schema. And we also see an implication that you don't, you aren't necessarily restricted to primitives. In this case, you can have an element called types that uses, clear, again, schema, and we're defining a set of types that apparently this service is going to make use of. Apparently, some of the inputs or outputs that might be used by this web service are, at the end of the day, not of type string, per se, or of decimal or float, but rather they're of type state type, which in turn is of type string, but it's restricted to one of these three values in this particular example. So if that WSDL file had this definition here and those operations we saw, get rate and so forth, specified that you could only choose these three states, um, Although, why is this, where this must have come from some other, yeah, this came from some other example, because that was, either, I don't think Texas and Ohio have different exchange rates currently. So this is taken out of context, but this is an example, apparently, of how you can specify um, more precise data types for your inputs and outputs. But I'd made a poor segue there from currency to states. Yeah. This isn't zip code. This is actually an address example, an address book example file that I think I included in the um, code for tonight. Yeah? Good question. So in the WSDL file, you have a method name, but how do you know which class that belongs to? It is the uh, SOAP engine that figures that out for you. You yourself, and this will make more sense in a moment, when you run a tool like WSDL to Java, you're going to dynamically, automatically generate Java files on your local machine that are going to have their own class names. And you're going to write code using those classes, which are probably going to be completely different from the class names with which the service is actually implemented on the server. All of that detail, level of detail is kept largely um, uh, hidden from you because it's not necessary to know the implementation details. All you need to know is the higher level details of what are the operations that are possible and what are the inputs or what are the outputs. You could then call your own stubs, foobar and baz, it's immaterial so long as the code is being transmitted over the wire as the SOAP engine expects. So WSDL wouldn't expose an object model? WSDL wouldn't expose an object model. I mean, it would expose, WSDL 
by way of schema that could be embedded in it would allow you to express types of objects that could be involved in the requests and response. But beyond that, uh, that would be the extent to which it's sort of um, oriented around objects. Other questions? There is, incidentally, an alternative way to embedding information in a web service call. You can use what's called document style, whereby rather than invoke a web service that, uh, whose operation, for instance, takes three inputs, say three strings, you would instead simply invoke the web service by just passing it effectively one big XML file that contains all of those inputs as just one unary or one singleton Object. And I'll wave my hands at this only because this is largely a detail of the um, particular service you choose or the toolkit you use to interface with it. Um, so we won't dwell so much on this. But just know that in browsing web services, you might see a mention of document style. But based on the tool you're using, that should be largely immaterial to you. It's more of an underneath the hood implementation detail. So how do you use WSDL, right? It's one thing to glance at it as a human or to download it and to look at it, but it's toolkits, ultimately, that actually use WSDL to do interesting things. Access is, again, a toolkit that can take a WSDL file, whether dynamically generated or just hosted on some website, Amazon's, for instance, and it can generate Java code that lets you use the methods that are described by that particular WSDL file. And this, again, was that WSDL to Java example. Time-wise, why don't we go ahead and take our five-minute break, and we'll return with demos of all of this. Okay. So we're back. So we've had sort of the basic foundation of what web service is, what SOAP is, what uh, WSDL is. So let's actually use this stuff now. So this is a web service that is provided sort of as a tutorial from this URL, if you'd like to pull it up after. Um, I'll offer this as an example of a fairly simple web service. We'll then use our own from that, uh, that site called xmethods.net, and we'll come full circle back to project four and look at our own web service as well. So here's the idea of this tax service. Um, you have somewhere on the internet um, this thing called tax service that apparently provides three pieces of functionality, a method called calc tax rate, calc subtotal, and calc total. So what are each of these? So let's look at the first one. Calc total, I'll tell you now, is designed to take the following. You provide it with a subtotal, and you tell it what the tax percent is, 5% in Massachusetts, and it effectively multiplies subtotal times 1.05, returns the result. Okay, completely inane to use, do this as a web service, but it illustrates sort of the point using fairly simple functionality. So both client and server code will be very simple. But the idea is the same. Purchasing.java sort of is the next step whereby it's more complicated than this. Calc tax rate, meanwhile, takes the subtotal and total, divides one by the other to figure out the effective tax rate. Calc subtotal similarly does it with the other two inputs. So this is perhaps the most straightforward of them. Again, simple, probably wouldn't need to uh, outsource this particular function functionality, but it illustrates the point. So in your code printout for tonight, the first page is a readme, which is meant to be a quick tutorial that I whipped up to tell you exactly how to run these demos yourself on your own machine. They're not terribly complicated, but there's enough files that it's at least tough to remember just a demonstration you saw just once in class. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into our examples 11 directory. There's two relevant directories now, clients and server. I'm going to go into server. This server directory is structured very similarly to project three and project four, so I kept the same sort of overall structure. Um, inside of the conf directory, therefore, is going to be a server.xml file. So I'm going to make sure that I have ports, say, 8080 here as well. I'm going to save that. Uh, now I'm going to go into web apps. And actually, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and just run Tomcat for a moment just to demonstrate how this is working. So I'm running Tomcat from inside of my server directory. I'm going to go back to my browser here. I'm still on ICE 4, but I'm not running Project 4 anymore, so I'm going to see this screen. I gave you the same JSP files just so that you can do a sanity check and make sure things are working. If you do this, say, after you're done with Project 4, hopefully Access is happy. And it is. And hopefully our environment is happy, and sure, it is. And now I'm going to go into, let's see. Oh, we need to keep that running, so I'm going to open up another terminal window. 
And I'm going to log in with the same account just so that I can get back into that same directory. And I'm going to go into the server directory, into web apps, and I'm going to go into taxes where quite simply, and I'm going to do a behind the curtain here thing, pretend that you didn't see that. There's a file in here called taxservice.java. So I'm going to open this file up, and it is the stupidest program that you've ever seen since CS1. Right? All it does is this class called tax service. Doesn't imp extend anything, doesn't implement any interface. This is like programming 101. It's got a method called calc tax rate that takes subtotal and total, and it's going to return a double. Uh, the other method down here, calc subtotal, takes total and tax percent, returns the appropriate value. And then the last one is calc total, which takes a subtotal and tax percent and returns a double as well. Let's just look at one of these because in spirit they're all equivalent. Apparently to compute the total that's due if you buy something say in Massachusetts at a store is you take the subtotal times one plus whatever the tax percent is and you get total and you return total. So I just took CS1. I'm terribly excited that I implemented this tax service that lets people figure out taxes or compute the money they owe and so forth. You know, I want to share this with the world. Thankfully, web services can allow me to do that. So we're going to take this very simple class that provides this fairly basic functionality that just happens to be based on primitives, and we're going to expose this now as a web service. So how do we do this? Well, assuming you have your servlet container up, up and running with Axis installed as your SOAP engine, as we have for Project 4, and I'm using the exact same configuration for this particular demonstration, it turns out now that if I want to expose this as a web service, the way Access allows me to do this is to take this taxservice.java file, put it in the appropriate web apps directory, and that's sort of old school um, setup stuff by now, and just rename it to taxservice. Take a guess. JWS, Java Web Service. That trivial change is going to be leveraged by Access as sort of a clue that this thing should be exposed as a web service. In fact, I don't even now have to compile it into a .class file. That's another sort of plus. I can just give it the source code and let Access handle the compilation for me. So it's even simpler there, say, than the setup we have for Project 4, which did have the bytecodes being moved to that class's subdirectory. Now, I'm going to go to the following URL. I'm going to go back to this. Notice that I'm going to go into my taxes web app. And then I'm going to specifically go to taxservice.jws. And notice this. It looks like Tomcat's intercepted this request for a file that does exist there. It's realized that it ends in .jws, and it assumes, therefore, that this is a web service. Access generates automatically this HTML link that if I click, automatically generates WSDL based on taxservice.jws, formerly known as taxservice.java. In other words, to emphasize how much utility Access provides you with, I just wrote a simple Java class, I rename the file, bam, it's now a web service, is the implication of this. A lot of this should be similar, at least in structure, and some of the keywords should be familiar. Calc total request, calc subtotal request. Notice the names of the parameters. Notice the schema types that are being used. So this is just an application of all those building blocks we focused on in the first half of tonight applied to that tax service that I, or they, who we borrowed it from, whipped up in a quick and dirty way. So how do we use this now? I'm going to go ahead and copy the URL of the WSDL file which just as before, Access uses this convention, essentially file name, question mark, WSDL, and Access uses that as its clue to say, ah, generate the WSDL for this file. I'm going to go back to my terminal window that I have a cursor at still, and I'm going to go into my client's directory, just so that I keep things nice and neat for demo purposes. And I, prior to tonight's class, whipped this up. Okay, we could do this on the fly, but it gets boring watching me type. So I whipped this up in advance. Looks long, but just because I started commenting it and such. Um, and this effectively, again, is taken from this particular demonstration, from that particular URL. So the only thing I'm going to change at this file to get it to work, and the one note you should make to yourself if you want to recreate these steps, is I just need to change the ice box at the top of the package line here. Now, why did I have to do that? I did that for the following reason. Notice that in this taxes directory, at least the way you'll download it from the course's website if you choose to do so, the only file in here is taxservice.java or taxclient.java. 
there is no networking code in this file. Okay, before I can use this web service, I need to use that WSDL and generate my so-called stub code. Well, how do I do that? It's as simple as on nice, and if you want to see what this is, WSDL to Java is just a shortcut for that. Java, org, Apache, access, WSDL, WSDL to Java. And that's mentioned, I think, in the project spec as well. So I'm going to run WSDL to Java on that URL. So I just paste it in the URL from my browser and I'm going to hit enter. What Access is doing by way of this particular tool, WSDL to Java, and again, you can ignore these warnings. It just has to do with um, unnecessary logging configurations we don't need to do. If I look now, ls, I now have a subdirectory, edu. In there is Harvard. In there is FAS. In there is ICE4. In there is taxes. In there is tax service underscore JWS. So already we see where this probably came from. And in there are these four files. So in answer to your question earlier about how do I know what class name to use, you figure it out based on the tool or the tool's documentation tells you the conventions to use. And if I now look inside of here, let's take a look at tax service.java. To be clear, these four files were automatically generated based on that WSDL file as promised. Turns out, and again, the naming conventions are dependent on the toolkit to some extent, the class names and so forth. But it looks like Axis, as per the comment, generated this interface called Tax Service, which does in fact extend something called java.rmi.remote, which effectively is Java's version of remote procedure calls. But you don't have to care about that. You don't have to write this code yourself, and the interface is using that information from the WSDL to prescribe these three signatures, and these are methods we will ultimately invoke. Now, the one catch, and I'll point it out now because it mentions throws here, the one catch, perhaps obviously, about using web services is that unlike LPCs, which sort of are guaranteed to return, assuming you implemented them on the same machine, RPCs, the catch is that even though the whole uh, transaction with the remote procedure call to you is transparent, there is now the chance that your method call will just never return. So in that case, in other words, something goes wrong, the internet breaks, your network connection goes down, the web service goes down, anything could go wrong. So you do have to supplement your own code with a catch block so that you catch an exception that might get thrown that normally if you wrote the code yourself, just would not happen by nature. So what else is in these files? So there's this tax service service, which is confusing only because I called the thing, they called the thing tax service and access appends its own mention of service. So let's take a glance at this file. This too is just an interface that extends javax.xml.rpc.service. Again, you don't have to worry so much about these details, but it seems to be specking out exactly effectively what the operations are for getting access to the web service. It looks like these are methods that are going to allow me to get an instance of that tax service, so to speak. It'll be an object that we get and actually call methods on. And I'll show you how we do this in a moment, just to give you a taste of tax service service locator. This essentially is Access's way of allowing you to get sort of an interface to the tax service, wherever it may be. And this is perhaps the meatiest of examples. Notice that in here is hard-coded the address. And again, this again is a hint as to why I wrote the proxy class for project four, because otherwise you deal with these ICE issues, which just get annoying. But all of this code was automatically generated by Access. It doesn't implement any of that multiplication of tax times subtotal or anything. This implements all of the TCP stuff that allows you to connect to that service, which is running elsewhere. Where is it running? Well, in this case, it's running in this other window. But the idea is the same. Could be over the entire internet. The last file is this tax service soap uh, binding stub. And this, too, has a whole bunch of code automatically generated. You didn't have to deal with it. So the takeaway, I dare say, is that if you weren't using web services, this is a lot of this code is stuff you would have to write if you wanted to provide this transport mechanism over the internet to execute what at the end of the day are fairly simple methods. So how do we use them? Well, this will depend to some extent on the tool you use to generate your source code from your WSDL file. But in this case here, in this taxclient.java, it simply requires that you make two method calls. In order to write a client now on my own computer that's connected to the internet that uses this remote tax service, 
I first have to get a copy of the service, a reference to it effectively, and then I need to get access to a port. So these two lines, you can sort of take them just as um, two requisite lines so far as access goes. These are the two lines of code you need to get access to the web servers. Thereafter, to invoke the methods provided by that tax service, it's like methods as usual. Just call port dot method name, port dot method name, port dot method name. Now I did, they did put this whole in a try block, and this is a little sloppy to be putting it all in one huge try block, but it gets the job done because these lines here can fail. These three lines here can fail. These three in particular, especially if your network connection goes down. You can simulate this at home, pull your internet connection out. This will fail if you're running the tax service on NICE, but you're running your code on your own PC. These last three lines just print out the results. So let's go ahead and run this thing. I'm going to go ahead and compile uh, taxclient.java. It, in turn, is going to recursively compile the requisite uh, package that was automatically generated. Again, ignore these warnings. It's because of the way Axis is generating the code and the Java 5 compiler doesn't love it. I'm going to now run tax, tax client. Ignore the warnings, but let uh, get rid of my control H there. What comes back are these three answers. Trivial mathematics, but those answers were computed across the internet in the tax service, which, okay, granted, is running on the same machine, but again, the point is the same. And you could demonstrate this yourself. If we actually had a JVM on this particular PC and I copied taxclient.java to the local machine and I ran WSDL to Java on this local PC and then I compiled taxclient.java on the local PC but ran the tax service server on ICE, that would work. I could run it at stanford.edu, and that would work as well. And you can try this at home. Run it on ICE, the server, but run the client on your own PCs, which presumably for Project 4 are configured now with access and such. Yeah? So absolutely. So if something goes wrong on the server that the server code catches, can you send back an appropriate message? Yes. Um, so you could do it certainly within the return value, so long as you yourself catch the error and the error is not generated by the skeleton and stub code that were being generated by the toolkit in question. So short answer is yes. Short answer is yes. But there, too, you sort of now have to know. And this is where the, the, the line gets sort of blurred. Or the, the abstraction between web service and client-side code does get blurred because you kind of have to know about the possible situations in which your code might get used. But fundamentally, you don't have to start writing network code yourself. You can just throw the exception yourself, or you can simply return the appropriate string yourself. I believe so long as it is, so long as the type of object you're throwing is documented in the WSDL file by way of, say, a schema, and it's just a string, for instance, or it's an int for a code, it should be able to handle that as well. But so long as the web service is exposed as supporting that. Oh, I'm sorry? Yes, it would have to be serializable as well. And I'll double check that this is the case because these simple examples don't bother throwing exception server side, but it should work so long as the, so long as the data is described by the service. So how do you tell access about these other object types? To some extent, these toolkits can generate them themselves. If you have a sufficiently simple structure that's not, for instance, cyclical, and if the data members themselves have primitives as opposed to just references to other objects and so forth. I would have, I've not had to do it with access myself because I've always kept everything fairly simple. But if you look at the particular, um, the documentation, frankly, for the tool you're using, there's a way, there should be a way to augment the information that it's exposing to the world as the web service description. Yes, if for the simplest of objects, it should be able to. But you can absolutely come up with uh, cases where it just it can't be serializable if it's, for instance, some kind of tree structure with cycles and so forth, then things get messy. OK, so let's try, rather than take this prefab example, let's do the following. If you visit at your leisure, xmethods.net. This is 
a site that's been popular for a few years. It's usually among the top hits on Google when you Google web services or web services directory. It's pretty good. Unfortunately, it's not really categorized, so it's not easy to find things, and the web services aren't constantly monitored to see if they're still up. But it is a nice starting point, if nothing else, just to find a web service, if only to play with it. But realistically, you're more likely to be proactively told about some web service that, say, you need to use for some work project or such, rather than seeking out some arbitrary web service on your own. Case in point, Amazon. If you want to interface with Amazon's web service, you're not going to go fishing for it through a directory like this. You would go to Amazon, follow their documentation, as you may have already, to actually access their own WSDL file. So one of the web services I did find through this um, directory that was sort of a sufficient simplicity that we could get it working, and it was up and running as of last night, was the following. So this was the zip code example that I alluded to earlier. What I went ahead and did, just so that I could find it easily again, is on the course's website on the lectures page, there's this HTML link to US zip validation. This is a link to the X method site. And this is just their standard way of describing a web service. So what's some of the interesting takeaways? So someone implemented this thing. And they submitted the URL to xmethods.net so the world would know about it. It looks like uh, this is the guy or woman who wrote it. This is apparently where it originally came from. Here's a quick description of it. Validates US zip code and provides state, latitude, and longitude. And down here, there's some detailed description. So here, returns US uh, Postal Service state abbreviation, latitude, decimal degrees, and longitude, decimal degrees. And then there's some usage notes and so forth. Um, but I will highlight how to do that. But the interesting thing up here is this, the WSDL file. So here's the URL of the WSDL that describes this web service. I, as the developer, don't, in theory, have to care where this thing is hosted, so long as it's up and running. I don't have to care in what language this web service is implemented. I don't have to care what platform that web service is running on. That, again, is one of the um, compelling features of web services. I just have to look at this file, or I just have to know that this file exists. I don't even have to read it, really, so long as I know exactly how to invoke the methods. The best web services typically do come with documentation, frankly. And among the links I gave you in the spec for Project 4 were some pointers to Amazon's documentation. It is not fun trying to infer from a WSDL file how to use it. You typically want humans who have generated the WSDL to tell you proactively how to interface with, say, Amazon's web service. You can do it. It's just a pain. So that's the upside of going to a directory or some kind of site that has documentation for it. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and copy this WSDL. I'm going to go back over to, let's see, my client's directory. And what? let's see. Yep, OK. So I'm going to move this to old since I whipped it up before to make sure I get it right. And I'm going to create a new file. Oh, actually, first, WSDL to Java. Paste in this new URL. Enter. Okay, ignore the warnings, just logging information. Type in ls now, and notice I have this com directory, which actually was there before, but it was just regenerated. Okay, there's this web service mart. There's this ws. And then there's a whole bunch of files, this time five files, based on how Axis chose to implement that particular web services stubs. How do I now go about using this? Well, again, you would have to look at the documentation either for your toolkit like Access to figure out what the naming convention is and so forth. But to actually use this thing now, I'm simply going to do the following. I'm going to open a file called zip, uh, what did I call it? Zip demo Java. I'm going to go ahead and copy this path so I remember what it is. OK, and here I'm going to say import that stuff dot star, change these to, oops, change these to dots. Okay, so essentially I'm importing all of the code that Access automatically generated. And just quick pop quiz, what do, what would one call the type of code that's in that directory? That Those are the stubs. So those are the stubs. It's not the implementation of the zip code stuff. It's just the network layer stuff that gets the inputs over to the service. All right, now I'm going to say uh, this is a class called, what, zip demo. I'm going to just give it a public static void main string args method. Oh, so close. OK, and I did a little uh, Julia Child's preprint out so I wouldn't screw up the typing live here. So how do we do this thing? Well, it's just going to take a couple lines of code to run a test of this. I'm going to go ahead and try, try 
the following. And I'm just going to generically catch an exception E, though we could be more specific if we really wanted to be. And what am I going to try to do? Well, using Axis's conventions, I'm going to say I want a US zip reference called service borrow the nomenclature from before. I'm going to use US zip locator. That's one of the stub classes that was generated. How do you know the naming conventions? Again, depends on the toolkit you're using. Oh, and to be clear, we're doing this all in Java. You could absolutely generate Perl stub code or C sharp stub code if you presumably have a tool that takes the same WSDL and generates the corresponding code. There lies your language neutrality. US zip soap, it happens to be called here, port service.get us zip soap. Those two lines are all that's necessary now to interface with that particular web service using the code that Access generated. Now I'm going to say, you know, system.out.println port.validate zip happens to be the name of the method. And that I think was in the documentation online, but you can infer it from the files as well. And now I just have to give it a zip code. Favorite zip code? 02138. Okay, I've saved the file. I'm going to go ahead and Java C on zip demo.java. Assuming I made no syntactic errors. <laughs> okay, cannot find symbol, so I messed up the package information, so let's double check this. Oh, where did it? Wasn't it here a minute ago? Or is it in here? Ah, there we go. Just in the wrong directory. Okay, Java C. Okay, those are just warnings because of Java 5. I'm going to go ahead and run uh, zip demo. Ignore the warnings. And notice the message we got back. So in this case, the web service is defined to return that particular formatting. So it returns a string that, if you read the documentation for the service, happens to return an XML fragment like that. And we could parse this if we want. And some web services will just return the string. Some will just return the int. But in this case, it does return this um, XML fragment, presumably because the web service is trying, as it promised, to return multiple return values. Right? In Java, you can only return one value. It's kind of messy to return an array or an object. So it returns an XML fragment that has all of the information promised, the state. Uh, the latitude and the longitude. So if you were to packet sniff, so to speak, this transaction, you would see a similar HTTP request with my information. You'd get an HTTP response, inside of which, inside the SOAP message, would be this string, instead of, say, poac.xsl. So it's pretty cool. And similarly for Project 4, will you use Amazon's web service in the same way? And so literally, when I gave you Project 4, I ran WSDL to Java on essentially HTTP colon slash slash, I think like AWS dot Amazon dot something. I gave it the URL of the WSDL file. I downloaded all those files and gave them to you. And the only reason I did it in advance is because Access, the web service that's provided by Amazon, uh, essentially there's a situation in which to construct an instance of one of the objects, there are, I think, a 260 possible parameters that you might provide. But in, in reality, you never provide all of them. But access by default, just so you know, generates typically a constructor for all objects that it needs to create. And it gives a constructor that contains all possible parameters. But Java 5 has a limit of 256 parameters for a method, for a constructor. And so the code that Access dynamically generates fails if you just run WSDL to Java and run Java C on it. So I simply commented it out with slash star and star slash, that particular constructor, which you would never, as a realistic human, use so that the code would compile for you out of the box, so to speak. But just FYI, if you generate it yourself and get a message like that. Mm -hmm. A stand yeah, so there are different, so I believe in X methods, what that's referring to is the skeleton that's being provided on the server side, which um, typically for most of these web services should be immaterial, so long as the WSDL is being provided. So is it 
It's not clear to me, to be honest. I actually last night tried to read over X methods about Page and their tutorials and so forth to understand exactly what they were promising when it came to some of these descriptor fields. The short answer is I wasn't sure as of last night. Um, so I went with one of the ones that was in particularly SOAP just to be safe that it would work. So I would have to dig deeper myself to see what it is X method is trying to tell us exactly. Oh, sure. Is there the concept of this of a session? It's a good question. Um, I don't know offhand because I've never had the need, at least myself. Um, right. No, it's a good question. Um, the short answer is I don't know. It's running over HTTP, which means you get cookies for free because of the transport protocol. I don't know if the web service, if any web services would use that. That's a good question. Let me actually try to dig that up and see. Other questions? Okay, so let's jump back here. So in project four then, you have this structure, and again, the web service happens to be running on the same box. That's largely just for convenience. But um, what you have in Project 4 is this purchasing service. That purchasing service, again, literally is designed to take an XML string as input, run poact.xsl on it, return the result. That's pretty much it. And a lot of your logic will presumably, unless you decide to change your approach, would be in poact.xsl itself. So what does that mean? Well, let's go back to our server directory here. I'm going to rerun Tomcat because among the files I did provide in our examples directory tonight in the server is actually a copy of the warehouse code. So inside of this warehouse directory are the exact, excuse me, same files and subdirectories that ship with Project 4. The only difference was I pre-compiled uh, purchasing.java and put it in the webinf classes directory so that we wouldn't have to bother with a build.xml file and ant just for some simple lecture demos. So all of the codes in there that you were given with Project 4 itself. So running now on the server is again not all of Project 4 but just part thereof. So if I go back to HTTP, ICE4 and go to I think warehouse is where I put it we should again see our warehouse. And again, this is the examples 11 version of warehouse. There's no instance of Scamazon running on here. But the reason for that is as follows. In my clients directory, I put one other particular demo, which is also documented in that readme. In the warehouse directory of clients is this file called purchasing.java, rather purchasing client. Java, which I whipped up just as an example that ties now Project 4 together with all the stuff we've just done tonight as follows. This is just a class. doesn't extend anything, doesn't implement anything. It's sort of your simple implementation of a class. But notice that it does import at the top this hard-coded uh, package name. And I have to change it to ICE4 in this instance. And this is what I wanted you to avoid when implementing your own Project 4s. But if you were now to take the sort of uh, approach that we've taken in this lecture to Project 4, this is what you would do to yourself implement purchasing.java without that proxy class that you're provided with. So if I want to interface with the purchasing web service, two lines of code after using access to dynamically generate the WSDL that I need, uh, purchasing service locator followed by get purchasing, now I have this port, and now recall that the service provides one method for you, process PO, so if I want to simulate Scamazon's transmission of PO to the service, I'm just going to say this. Yeah, I've got nothing interesting to say tonight. We're just going to send this root element so that presumably we'll get back POAC.xml, or rather in XML format. This time I was more specific, catching an access fault rather than waving my hands at an exception in general. So now I'm going to go ahead and, one, I need to run WSDL to Java on what? What exactly? Yeah. On the what? On the warehouse. So how do we gain access to its WSDL file? Right, because this is the warehouse, but again, this picture is just meant to be sort of a dummy placeholder. Where does the sorry? How do I, where, so I know there's a web service somewhere in there, right? But 
how do, where's the description for it? Where's the WSDL file? Because I don't get the WSDL file in, say, the distribution code. I want access to generate it. Well, if you recall, just from maybe the spec itself, and we, I think we looked at this earlier, if you go to that path for project four, what you should get is the automatic generation of that WSDL file. And then again, to be clear, we've seen different approaches to the automatic generation of WSDL. We had that quick and dirty and pretty neat approach of just taking a Java file, rename it .jws, and because of that web.xml file we glanced at earlier, Access interprets that as a web service. Alternatively, with project four, you compile purchasing.java, purchasing.class, then goes in the classes directory of webinf in the warehouse subdirectory, and because of that same web.xml file, it knows to look for slash services slash star for bytecodes that collectively implement a web service. Here's the WSDL then. So if I want to use this web service, which happens to be running on ICE4, I just go to my client window and I go ahead and type WSDL to Java, paste in that URL, hit enter. Again, ignore the warnings. LS, now I've got that EDU, Harvard, FAS, ICE4, and so forth, which I already configured purchasing client with at the very top line. So let's go ahead and compile the client. Okay, those are just warnings. Java of purchasing client, warnings, poac.xsl. And just as a sanity check here, if I go to server, let's say uh, web apps, uh, warehouse, xsl, poac.xsl, hello world, change that. Now let's run the client again. Oh, I'll put it at the top of the screen. I'm getting back now the modified POAC.xsl file. So there you have it, sort of web services from start to finish. You're using it in Project 4. You'll use it for real in Project 4 with Amazon. So what this final project is really meant to do is offer you a bit of a segue from sort of our sandbox projects to real world use of some of this stuff. So hopefully you'll enjoy actually using a real and fairly robust API whose documentation, I will concede, is none so great, which is why I provided you with the ecs.jsp as an example and as many pointers as I could. But please do feel free to communicate over the listserv about uh, Amazon in particular as you uh, play with it. Any parting questions? All right, let's conclude here and we'll run section right after in this room since we have, uh, actually, well, it's almost end, so we'll go down the hall to the other room.